The work the SAG Foundation is doing is enormously important. From the up and coming actors to the veterans like myself, the Foundation is here to help all of us. As fellow artists, we've all been there. It's crucial that we remember where we came from and help out however we can. For over 25 years, the SAG Foundation has been the industry's best kept secret, and we're out to change that. As natural storytellers, it's great that we have the opportunity to give back through the children's literacy program. A disaster like Sandy really brings it home with how crucial the SAG Foundation is. Their donation drive helped so many people in need. The seminars and workshops are crucial. Working together is what makes us better. The SAG Foundation is a nonprofit organization that relies solely on donations to keep these important programs free for everyone. The SAG Foundation can't do it alone. We need you. If you need help, ask. If you can help, give. We're all in this together. 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 Together, everyone benefits. Join the cause. Back now. So thank you so much for coming. A lot of you know who we are, I hope. Um, if you don't, my name is Trevor Algott. I'm AJ Meyer. And we host a, a podcast called Inside Acting. It's been on the web for a couple years now, since 2009. And uh, this is our 100th episode. So we're really thrilled to be here live um, with a live studio audience um, <laughs> at the SAG Foundation to be doing this, this panel. So we've got an awesome lineup of people to help um, clarify some of the uh, questions that maybe people have about unions and SAG signatories and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, but uh, anything about us that, that we should talk about besides who we are and what we do? Is there anyone who, who, who has never listened to the podcast before? That, that might be an interesting, just a handful of you. Okay. All right, so we have some fans in the audience. That's cool. All awesome. Right. That's well, pretty Well, thank cool. you so much for being here, and uh, hopefully you get some questions answered with the, uh, the moderators as well. Awesome. Cool. Let's get started. All right, then. Let's roll. Uh, uh, so we've got an awesome lineup. Um, why don't you guys come on up and... Uh, have a seat. Ladies and gentlemen, your panelists. Yes. <laughs> so we thought we'd just kind of start um, by asking you guys to kind of briefly introduce yourselves and, and give us a little taste of uh, your mission slash role uh, within the union. So um, I guess, right, we could probably start with you because you're kind of closest to us here. And that's what I get for standing up. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Ray Bradford. I'm National Director of Policy and Diversity Advocacy at SAG-AFTRA. So you may ask yourself, what is that? Uh, it is the department that's the primary liaison to outside organizations, creating relationships, maintaining relationships, uh, primarily in the labor movement, whether it's the AFL-CIO, affiliate unions around the country, or everything from state to the local level, as well as uh, advocating on behalf of the various constituents that would fall under the diversity umbrella, whether it's with minority journalist associations, civil rights organizations, nationally and locally, all across the board. Uh, I call the department the relationship department. It's my job, our job, to be there in the room, create the relationships long before you need those relationships. So we're all speaking the same language, whether they want something from us or we want something from them to further our members' interests. And uh, that's a little bit of, uh, of what the department is and answer questions later on. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Woody Schultz, uh, proud SAG and AFTRA, and now SAG AFTRA member for about 18 years now. Um, I am also a SAG AFTRA board member. I am the founder and current national chair of the Performance Capture Committee. Uh, I'm on several other, uh, <laughs> about 10 other uh, committees at, at SAG AFTRA, and uh, I am also one of the producers of the SAG Awards. Hi, my name is Ted Sinclair, and I'm the managing director of TV Contracts. My department signs new um, signatories, producers, onto the various TV agreements, the SAG television agreement, after his Exhibit A, um, and, and our other specialized agreements, and then we enforce that agreement on, on members like yourself's behalf. My name is Fatma Salak William. I'm an employee of SAG AFTRA. I work for the theatrical contracts department where we uh, sign all the low budget um, agreements uh, for only motion pictures. And um, uh, that's it. 
Hello, I'm Jill Seltzer. I'm the executive director of the Screen Actors Guild Foundation, and this is my debut. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very excited you came to my living room tonight. And um, this is exactly the kind of event that we want to bring to you to give you as much information for you to pursue your careers that you, that you can. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Ned Vaughn. I'm the executive vice president of SAG-AFTRA. And uh, I've been a member of, uh, well, I, I joined SAG in 1986, and I joined AFTRA uh, right about 2002, 2003. Uh, worked very hard to uh, get SAG and AFTRA merged and was thrilled with the, the fact that that happened uh, last March. I've been a working actor since I joined SAG in 86, so it's over 25 years now, and it's, uh, it's a lot of this and that. I mean, some big famous films and lots of little jobs that nobody's ever seen and everything in between. And uh, because of the protections that we all derive from being members of a union, I've been able to uh, not only make a living, but uh, support a family. I have five young children, and uh, I'm deeply grateful for all of that and happy to be with you tonight. Hi, I'm Leon Morden Kitchhaven, and I have the honor and privilege of being the executive director of the Los Angeles Local, which is the largest local in the union. We have about 70,000 members. And my role is to work with the board of directors of SAG-AFTRA, as well as all the local committees. I oversee all the programs, member education, film society, conservatory, as well as work within the community and in local legislation to advocate for all of our members. Awesome. awesome. Well, thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I just want to say, it's, it's, it's awesome that we're here for the 100th episode, so we finally hit syndication, baby. <laughs> <laughs> we're there. I'm I having a hard time a couple of episodes back saying the word centennial, so we have this joke now that this is our Sentinella episode. <laughs> I think that's what eventually came out, yeah. 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 And I um, left off one of the, the proudest parts of my bio is that I am, I am an right. Inside Acting alum. Yes. yes, yes. Woody's the only one on the panel who's actually been on the podcast before. <laughs> yeah. um, we, didn't, we didn't get too much of the nitty gritty of uh, the unions, though, at that time. We, we had a couple of questions for you, but this is perfect. I mean, uh, yeah. thank you all so much for being here. We really appreciate it. So to give you guys a, a rundown of how the evening will go, we're going to spend the first 45 minutes kind of uh, asking questions that we have, questions that we've gotten from our, we've received from our listeners in the past. And then the second 45 minutes, we'll just open it up to questions from you guys, from the audience watching us on live stream. We're on the internets right now somewhere. Hi. I don't know where that camera is, but <clears throat> um, this is being broadcast all over the world. It's amazing. Mm. So uh, that's kind of how the evening will, will go down. Cool. cool. So <laughs> sweet. Go for Are it. Are we man. gonna? Do we start with with questions that you have? Awesome. Okay. Cool. So we have like a bunch of uh, a bunch of things that I know we all talked about on the phone about a week ago. But my burning question um, is that there's a lot of different ways to get in the union now, and one of the questions that we probably get on the podcast the most is uh, how do you become a SAG signatory? And how do you kind of use new media to, to kind of get your way into the union? What does it mean to have a union web series versus a non-union web series or new media kind of thing? I know that's kind of a broad question, but Ned, did you want to kick well, off? Well, uh, yeah, I'll start, and then I'm going to want to turn it over. Uh, I, I just want people to be aware. I, I, I know that people focus on that ability to uh, become a signatory to the new media contract, develop a new media project, and, and gain eligibility to join the union. They're are some conditions that are going to be put on that, and, and I'm going to let Ted and others who want to talk to that, but it, it's also imperative to point out that there are a lot of other ways to join the union. Obviously, I, for the majority, the great majority of our members, they are not joining because they're becoming signatories themselves. They are being hired for productions that are already signatory, sometimes have been signatory for years and years, or it's a new production, and uh, that's a, it's a more traditional way of joining. And, uh, but this is something a lot of people are interested in. Uh, Ted or Ileon, do you guys want to talk a little bit about that? Okay, sure. I mean, becoming signatory, depending on the department, it, it varies greatly. I mean, the, if you're signing on to a, you know, the, the theatrical film agreement or the television agreement, it can be quite a complex you know, scenario. Um, when we may take financial assurances. We may do things like that. 
um, signing on to the new media agreement is a much easier process. We actually have an online signatory application, which is an online, exactly that, signatory application. It, it helps you sign on to our agreement. You can literally do it very quickly. That being said, where we will only, uh, you know, we only want to sign legitimate production. So if somebody is just forming a new media production in order to become a, a, you know, a member, we are going to look into at that in our, quite frankly, our new media agreement or experts in sort of discovering the, you know, not real projects. Yeah. You know, I, j I just want to add that. Um, one thing that I think people don't realize is that we've got different contracts for different budgets, and everyone automatically thinks union expensive. And we go all the way down to a student contract where you can actually have, actually have access to the talent pool for free. So, um, you know, our new media rates are, are you know, they're, they're very re doable, they're within reach. Um, you know, and I think that that's what a lot of people don't understand. If you go to our production center online at sagafter.org, there's all the documents on there. You become a signatory to our lower contracts. I think it takes about 11 minutes, maybe less. And you know they review it, and they contact you, and you're a signatory. So it's, it's really easy. Very cool. And there are also some great video tutorials uh, on the Production Center website as well. So, On the Production Center website? Yeah. <coughs> to doing the applications, you mean? For, yeah, for the process and, for, and, uh, and to lead you through the different uh, types of contracts there are. And it's, it's I mean, for, throughout the entire website. But well, well, beyond, <coughs> beyond the, the, the uh, demonstrations that Woody's talking about on the website, the union actually hosts uh, workshops about the new media agreement and, and how to develop new media productions. In fact, there's one going on right now in our Cagney boardroom. Uh, it's once I think it's once monthly. Is that yeah, right? And, and so we're very much into the you know the DIY spirit of, of, of folks creating their own productions. I just I started with that sort of initial uh, caution because I, I just don't want people to think that hey I can go make my little movie in the backyard for ten minutes and, and stick it on YouTube and I can join SAG AFTRA. It doesn't work quite that way. Cool. I'm, I'm really glad you just clarified that because I know that that's been in the circ some of the circles that I run in, that's the thinking. Yeah. Is that people say, hey, you know, we'll just shoot something this weekend and then throw it up on YouTube and <coughs> bam, we've got an IMDb credit and we're in the union and like all that yeah. stuff. So people, people have started referring to it not necessarily as a production but as a loophole. Right. You yeah. know, which, uh, you know, it, is, it literally is, is in a lot of circles been headlined the new media loophole as a put, which I think is a, a really, um, it's a shame that people kind of look at it that way, you know, as opposed to what is it that you're creating? Like, you're, you're literally just doing this so that you can become a, uh, you know, a member? Well, yeah. as, as Ted pointed out, you know, we're going to focus <coughs> on making sure that a production that, qua that, that is signed as a signatory to our contract is a bona fide production with right. legitimate purposes. And uh, while the new media contract allows for free bargaining, in other words, there are no minimums, so you, you could be in a position where uh, the financial outlay there is minimal, uh, there are assurances that still have to be met. You have to pay p and I mean, there's a 16.5% P&H contribution, and you have to, uh, when you sign this uh, uh, agreement, you have to make good on that. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to let people know that that is part of it. I mean, it is a union contract, but as Ilion quite rightly said, We've made the signatory process very efficient, and what you really get, I, I mean, our contracts and our signatory pro process from new media right on up to the big daddy, TV theatrical, is all about giving people access to the very best talent in the world. Mm -hmm. And you get that talent at various levels, as Ilion said. I mean, I, I know people who have won uh, Academy Awards and Emmys, and, and they go do student films because they know somebody or they just love the project and, and, and that's in the mix too. And everybody needs mm -hmm. to, to know that that's there. Any other names, Ned? <laughs> <laughs> I and swore also, I'd never tell. <laughs> uh, and, and also to remember that even though the, the rates for the actors on, uh, with these contracts is, is negotiable uh, between you know, the, the producer and the, and the actor, you still have to adhere to state uh, minimum wage. Uh, guidelines. So you, you, it's not like you can just get everybody for free, period, across the board. I mean, you do have to pay them and pay them at least minimum wage, whatever that state minimum wage is.
Cool. I, I, I'm curious who who does the um, who 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 makes the judgment call on whether a production is legitimate or not. How, what does that process look like? I do. You do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It'd be we pay your, wage. It'd be your <laughs> new media counterpart, right? Yeah, I, we yeah. we have a new media department, and they and they are business reps. They have a manager. They have a, a national director, and they're all. You know, they're sort of expert in that agreement, and they're the ones that are kind of trained to look at, to determine whether the production is bona fide or not. Hmm. Yeah. You know, cool. and these workshops are open only to members, but anyone who's interested. So we have that workshop. It occurs every month. It's here in the building. We also have a workshop if you're interested in the low-budget agreement, mm -hmm. and you want to come learn about the low-budget agreement and what's accessible, we have that as well. So they're just open. Um, the information is at sagafter.org. If you go to LA Local, you can see a schedule right on there. And just one, one more note on the new media front. I, you know, the new media department was mentioned, and uh, we would have had someone from the new media department here tonight, except for the fact that they are at South by Southwest, understandably, and, and it's part of what we do as an organization to keep laying the groundwork to, to have our presence ever more substantially, uh, you know, inserted into that world because we really not only want, but we need to be part of it. We as members have to be part of it because mm -hmm. that change is happening whether we like it or not. Is there some new media stuff going on at South By? Just, uh, just a bit, <laughs> a little bit. <clears throat> I kid, I kid. Uh, I have a question for Jill because I want to um, really I want to talk about some of the services because you just mentioned that you know these workshops are open for non-members, and I was just thinking about uh, I got a tour of the space before obviously we were going to do this podcast, and there's some amazing stuff in the building. But I wanted to be clear with you for the services that are available here. That's for union members only. Yes, like the, the majority of our programming is for <coughs> union members. So, so I get so I got a tour. At, so if you're in Los Angeles uh, or you visit Los Angeles and you're a union member. I got a tour of the space before we, we, we did this, and there's some unbelievable resources here. Like, it's kind of ridiculous, like the awesome stuff that's in this building. They have an entire, entirely new uh, uh, voiceover uh, booth to come and record the Don LaFontaine uh, you know, voiceover studio. There's a, there, there's a computer lab with computers set up for video editing so you can you know, edit your reel. Um, a library. What am I missing? I mean, there's so much cool stuff available. Can we here. hire him? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I am always looking for work. I'm an actor. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, and if I miss anything, please, you know, fill in the gaps. But it just, I didn't know that the, the workshops were available for non-members. No, not the workshop. I have just meant just the, the those um, new media mm -hmm. and the, yeah, the, the contract workshops are. Right, that's right. What I, I that's thought, what I right, because we also have uh, programming, but those are for members. Right, right, right. We have ongoing, and we work in partnership with the foundation. The foundation has remarkable programs available, such as conversations and life raft programs, and they really deal with the whole um, performer in every aspect of their life. So we're very grateful to the foundation for offering. We do have an uh, outreach program, Literacy Book Pals, and that is one program that is open to non-union members as well, and that's where people go into the public schools and read to kids predictably every Thursday afternoon at 3 o'clock. And what we found is it's majority are sag after members, but there are, there are a few that are not. Um, it's a little like going to the gym and honing your skill. If you can hang on to 33 third graders, you know what you're doing. <laughs> um, so it's important for you to know that while the majority of the programming that we offer serves sag after members and, and um, actually union members in New York more often than not, there will be equity people attending our programs as well. It is through our literacy program that non-union members are encouraged to participate. Very cool. So cool. They read to large groups of kids. You said 33 or so. Yeah, it's one. amazing the size of the public school classrooms. The number of children that are in, uh, usually with a single teacher. Um, so our nice. book pals are heroes because they they show up when they say they will, and uh, it's it's an important resource. That's wow. awesome. I saw some heads nodding when she was talking about that. Have you done it? So there's somebody in the audience who's done it. That's really cool. Th uh, thank you for being in service for the kids. That's really cool. For the kids. The kids. Do it for the kids. <laughs>
So for those of you listening on the live stream, since you can't hear anybody in the audience, what she was saying is that it re she was agreeing with Jill that it really does hone your craft because if you can keep you know a team full or a room full of kids engaged, you really know what you're doing. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. On that note, actually, I have, I have another question about <coughs> voiceover land. Um, we have a lot of, I mean, obviously today, today in 2013, we have a lot of actors who are kind of dipping their toes into the voiceover world. And Audible just created a Audible Content Exchange or a Creation Exchange, something like that, acx.com. And so a lot of actors now are being contacted directly by authors and they're recording audiobooks and things like that. But from what I understand, and this is my limited scope of my knowledge in this area, there's a bit of a gray area when it comes to the unions in that world. Do any of you have any information I can, or can clarify what well, the role that you not, not so gray on audiobooks. I mean, we, we, we cover audiobooks, yeah. and we have actually a, a fairly newly uh, uh, ratified agreement with Audible. Uh, cool. It's a terrific, uh, it's, it's a quarterly contract. It's on 13-week cycles, uh, you know, and it, can, it, it provides uh, an actor who is signed to the contract, uh, you know, I, and I don't know the particulars right off the top of my head, but there's a certain number of hours of uh, narration that you have to deliver per week uh, to Audible, and uh, you're signed, as I said, on a 13-week cycle. I don't know how many books they get out of you in 13 weeks, to be honest, but uh, it's, it's something that a lot of members, uh, uh, a lot of our members have been doing for some time now, not just through Audible, but through some other employers as well. And uh, it's obviously a very rewarding work for those members who do it. Um, I don't know, does anybody in contracts want to say anything else about that? Yeah, that work is covered under the non-broadcast educational contract. There's a whole section on audiobook. Cool. And, yeah, I would have one, one more thing. One thing that people may not realize in terms of like recorded books or video games or those areas that tend to skew a little bit off the radar for the general public of, of, of seeing actors and stuff like that, that the unions really were pioneers in getting union contracts and protections for its members. Uh, years ago, the first contract was with Electronic Arts, and it's grown ever since with other employers. Uh, on the audiobook side, uh, you know, and we now have contracts with several other employers uh, to bring the protections there. But I did want to tie one thing in to the new media thing, that as the unions try to make it affordable to have producers have access to qualified union professional talent. Uh, there are many areas where we will not compromise our responsibilities in the union to still provide protections, whether it's making sure that you are paid a minimum wage according to federal or state statutes. Uh, in our areas, areas of diversity and discrimination, that is one area in particular where we make sure that no matter what the budget is, if it's a union contract, or if it's a union contract and there are non-union people on there, the protections afforded by the contracts still are applicable. And that applies for whether it's age, and I think here in the room and for people out in, in Webland, uh, the law protects anybody 40 years of age or older. A lot of people think it's much older. So age, 40 years of age, older, race, ethnicity, disability, whether real or perceived, a whole range. There are protections. The union fights on behalf of minors under the age of 18. We do that by contracts, legislatively, and through advocacy groups. And so I did want to put that in there, the fact that while the unions are leaders and try to find creative, efficient, and affordable ways to give producers uh, access to professional talent, there are certain things that we will not compromise. And those are the core values of the unions that are protections uh, that we bring to the members. Mm. That's really awesome. I was actually just going to say that it must be like there's this thing called the Red Queen Theory, the Red Queen from Alice in Wonderland tells Alice she has to keep running as fast as she can to stay in the same place. Like, it must feel <clears throat> with you, with the union trying to keep up with what's going on in the industry, it must kind of feel that way. Like, you know, I can, ima I can only imagine what it was like creating a new media, you know, uh, contract team. Like, okay, go, you know, and it's just this brand new world. And you know at what made me think of it was you bringing up the Audible thing. It's a whole new thing that's just now starting to gestate, and it's like the unions. Okay, we gotta we, we get to protect our our actors, our un, our union members. But we don't have anything in place yet to do that. So then you go and and have to respond like you said legislatively or through advocacy or through contracts um, to keep up with the changing times. It's it I I, it, I have this like 
vision of a boiler room where you guys work. Well, well let me, <coughs> actually the boiler room is the workplace. And, and I'll tell you, I mean, the, the audio book, uh, the audio book experience and the, the, the contract that we got last year for music videos, very similar situation. Where what what and and Woody Woody's can, super can, excited he, about that. He, one. He, he can tell you all about his particular boiler room. Uh, <laughs> but 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 the the uh, the point that I'm making is that in the in the period before the union comes to assert uh, and really actually practically have its jurisdiction in an area, we sometimes will have members who are working in that area when it is still a gray area. Audio books not gray anymore. But there was a time when the union's ability to assert that we cover audiobooks, it's this brand new medium, uh, you know, is in question. And so you'll have members, it, it, we're not asserting it as a covered area, and so we have our members working it. This is similar to what happened in the uh, music video uh, situation. We had lots of members who were working on music videos. We weren't. Uh, we weren't asserting that that was covered, well, we were asserting that it was covered jurisdiction, but we had not won the jurisdiction through recognition by a contract. And what happened was, you know, we have these dancers who had been working for literally decades trying to get this contract from the major recording labels, and, you know, through repetitive cycles, they'd come together, they'd strategize, they'd say, what is it we need, what kind of basic protections must we have that we're not getting, and, and the industry, those record labels, fought that very, very vigorously for many years. But just after the merger uh, last summer, we finally acquired our first contract with those record labels. And it's a huge deal because now that jurisdiction is recognized by both sides. And that is, there's no question about that area anymore. If it's a music video, SAG after covers it with those ma major record labels. Mm -hmm. And we expect our members to honor that, and we expect the employers to honor it. And we will build that contract over years to be a richer and richer contract. Same way with audiobooks. The same sort of process happened. And that's how you grow jurisdiction and grow your members' earnings. Yeah, and you must, you, I was just going to say, I mean, you just spoke into it, but I was, I was just about to say you must get a lot of pushback any time that one of these new doors opens up because it's not always in the best interest of the producers to have these protections for their talent, right? Because it's much easier for them not to. It is always in their best interest. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it is I was trying to be as political as possible. I was trying to be interest. as political as possible uh, with that question. Well, I mean, look, it's, and I don't want to hog the mic here, so I'm not let it, but it, it's, it's obviously, it's more expensive because providing those protections and providing our members the kind of compensation that they deserve costs producers a little bit more. But what they get in return, we believe, and I think we've shown time and again, more than offsets the cost that they pay. They get access to professional talent that can deliver the job in a way that non-professional talent simply cannot. And it's a big deal. I don't know if they cost them more, I have to tell you, because, um, you know, well, I, well, because they have to redo things over and over again. I mean, I remember, you know, during the 2000 commercial strike, they hired all the non-union actors, and then the minute the strike was settled, they went and they reshot everything because they realized that nothing had the professional <coughs> quality. So I don't well, know in the long run. Uh, I, I really some, think that they need to great, rethink that. that. And it's not so. always an issue of money. I mean, uh, you know, video games are, are a great example of one of those areas that, you know, that and the beginning of video games was a very gray area. And it wasn't about the money because the producers of the video games were oftentimes paying the performers, you know, three and four times what the what scale was. Wow. Um, so it really was, it, it's, for them, they seemed to, you know, the paperwork and, and the precedents and the things like that, it's just any, any sort of change or any, any anytime they have to sort of give an inch on anything, I, I think it's just a knee-jerk reaction to, to fight it. But it's that way for everyone, I think, on all sides. Um, but these gray areas have existed, you know, historically throughout this union. I mean, beginning with, you know, the formation of the union in the first place. Uh, but, you know, I mean, session singers and puppeteers and, and comedians and, and uh, you know, video games and dancers, I mean, and, and on down the line. Uh, but progress has been made and we do eventually, uh, you know, have these amazing wins and, and, and get coverage for all of these performers.
I was going to say that sometimes the gray area is not so gray. Sometimes it's, they just don't want to be told what to do and on whatever price break. I mean, about tw 11 years ago, speaking of comedians, uh, when African-American comics were vying to appear on a, on a particular show of stand-ups and stuff, they came to us as a union saying, you know, by the time they pay us the $250, we've already spent more than that on wardrobe and travel and stuff, so we're actually paying for the privilege of working and what can our union do for us. And we started stepping up to the plate years ago and the employer just did not want to do that. We're not talking an awful lot of money. It was a principal thing. Mm -hmm. And they left LA, they went to Texas, they went to another city. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, from an advocacy point of view, we started coalescing partners in the civil rights arena all the way up to the NAACP because we, we realize when we're talking with partners that it's very easy sometimes in this culture to talk about labor issues and kind of like either blast it or put it on a shelf somewhere. And in the areas of equality and, and a living wage and affordable health care, those are for me and the union, those are basic civil and human rights. And when you start having that conversation with people on that level, it starts making a difference. And we were able to get the, con the contract for those stand-up comedians. And that's like one example of triangulating an issue when employers just sometimes just don't want to do it on principle. So. Wow, how interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Yeah. Well, I mean, they are. They're, they're fighting for us, right? So that's, that's really cool to, to hear. Um, I want to shift gears, unless you have more to say on this topic. Uh, I do, but I'm actually going to... I'm going to cut it off. <laughs> I'll tell you why. Later. I'm going to refrain. Um, I, I, I mean, I think it's on everybody's mind because it just happened and it was a tectonic shift. But I would really like to talk about the merger. Um, you know, it happened. Uh, third time's a charm. And, uh, you know, there's still a lot of questions in the air. A lot of actors out there are <sighs> confused. And some people are wondering... Uh, you know, I know there's a lot of questions out there about healthcare right now. There's a lot of questions about, you know, who's got what in terms of contracts. So um, I think that uh, I agree with the, the majority. I mean, obviously, the majority agreed because we took a vote and it, 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 they merged. I think it was the best thing for us uh, as, as a community. But I'm wondering if you guys can speak into, and literally, I'm just opening up the broadest possible question, speak into what has changed and what you see as the future possibilities for the, the, the one union and, uh, and what challenges are still being faced, such as health care? Uh, well, I'll, <coughs> I'll, I'll start with this one because obviously the merger has affected all of us in this room and all, all the staff and all the members, uh, but I got into union service expressly to see if I could help others get the unions merged because I saw what was happening uh, back in 2008 when SAG and AFTRA had uh, in their bargaining relationship on the TV theatrical uh, contract had split apart they were at this sort of uh, breakdown uh, public breakdown and were getting very competitive with one another and the rhetoric in the press was very hot and I just got a sense at that time that this was going in a very bad direction and that we had to bring these two unions together or we we're going to keep the, repeating that through, uh, you know, successive contract cycles. And it was going to start to damage me and other middle class working actors who were simply struggling to make a living and get our insurance and do all the other things that, uh, you know, any working actor is concerned about. And so I, along with Woody and, and so many other members worked uh, very hard for uh, about four years, uh, turning things in a direction so that uh, we could uh, mount this, what was ultimately a successful merger effort. And it was approved, as you know, uh, in uh, March 30th, 2012. It was overwhelmingly approved by the members of both unions. It was an 86 approval by, 86 percent approval by after and 82 and a little bit uh, from SAG members. So absolutely clear uh, sentiment from the members that this needed to be done. And it wasn't surprising, frankly, because in my work life as an actor, uh, putting aside my union leadership role, it's, it, it was on everybody's lips. You know, it's like, this is, 
we had gotten to this point where now the producers were shifting uh, a lot of their television, new television production to AFTRA from SAG contracts where it had been uh, in the previous years. And people were suffering all sorts of problems, including, uh, you know, you mentioned health insurance. People were having their earnings divided and they were failing to make health insurance because, you know, that's a function of how much you earn under the contracts, but there were the two health insurance plans. There still are. What the merger has done, I, I, I remain an unmitigated fan. I mean, we are in so much better a position than we would have been had we not merged. Uh, the, the future, had we not merged, was going to be very, very tough, in my opinion. I think you would have seen the unions become increasingly competitive, would have uh, potentially gone to the point where there were lawsuits about jurisdiction, and that is a disaster. You don't want to do that when you're representing the same membership. I mean, it's, it's not like it's even two different groups of people. It's the same people who are being fought over by two organizations, and it's not serving that group of people. So what it's changed is that it has put all the contracts under one union umbrella. There's one place to go for answers now. You don't have to worry, is it, is it these terms or is it those terms or who, who do I call to get the answer? It's all in one house. That's a big deal not only from members getting information, but from contract enforcement, which is one of the most important things we do. We have a unified approach to contract enforcement now. It's coming out of one place, a very big deal. Uh, our operations, all in one place. There's no redundancy anymore. It is one streamlined organization uh, that ultimately is going to serve members better than two organizations that do things a little differently ever could. Uh, you know, I'm not Pollyanna about it. Of course, it's not a 100% smooth process. Whenever you bring two organizations that are as uh, big and complex and frankly have their own unique cultures that have developed over decades, you know, there, there's some bumps in, in, in getting that road laid out. But we continue to uh, manage those, I think, quite well and uh, really are putting ourselves in, a, have already put ourselves in a position to realize the best of what we, as a working community of professional performers, can accomplish. The, the final thing I'll say about it for, for the moment, I'll talk, I know the, the health insurance thing is going to come up, so maybe I'll say something about that in a separate little bit, but the bottom line is this. It never made sense to have actors, musicians, uh, <coughs> you know, recording artists, singers, all, all the people who are hired by the media conglomerates, they are united on their side of the bargaining table. To have us divided, it, it's just, it never made any sense. Our strength has got to come out of being in one house together, speaking with one voice at the bargaining table. That's what we've accomplished. And, and at that fundamental level, there is no better alternative. Well, I, I was exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> all, all, all of it. Awesome. <laughs> Well, I'm, I come from the TV world, and you know, and as, as Ned pointed out, that that's sort of where the jurisdiction kind of started to split several years ago. And I'll tell you, I mean, SAG and AFTRA individually did their best at enforcing the contract, the same contract, SAG's television agreement, AFTRA's Exhibit A agreement, the exact same terms minus Section 14, preference of employment, but everything else is the exact same. And we did, as two div, you know, individual entities, did our best to try to enforce the contracts equally and, and the same. But you can't do it when you're two different organizations. You simply can't. You know, there are nuances. There's difference in staff levels. There's difference in, you know, the, the way that the studios are, are dealing with the different organizations, putting putting one against the other, or, you know, if you're not going to enforce this provision, you'll get our next show. I mean, all of, the, all of that is now gone. My department, you know, and, and television, um, the two departments, you know, television from SAG and television from AFTRA were both big, healthy departments, and now we're a very big department. Mm -hmm. And, 
you know, when you think about like the, the possible, and I was a little bit nervous about the possible bumps in the road, but I'll tell you, I mean, everybody, all the staff has the same common goal, which is to do our best for our members and enforce the agreements and to, you know, really have consistency moving forward. And I think it's, you know, for my life, it's made it a lot easier. And I think we're, we're much better able to protect our membership. Yeah, one other thing that I wanted to say that you, you kind of mentioned when you said you know, conglomerates is that was a that was a big sort of eye-opening, uh, I guess, moment for me when you started seeing almost on a weekly basis, uh, you know, studios and production companies and all these entities being bought up one way, one after the other by these huge conglomerates, most of whom had nothing to do with the entertainment industry. And, uh, you know, where the unions were, uh, you know, decades ago was sort of like, you know, actors were, you know, as if you were in a high school. Most of the teachers there, the principal kind of sort of, you know, knew every student that was there, at least by face, most by name. But, you know, then it was like all of a sudden going to this huge university where you were nothing more than a social security number. To these people, you know, to the companies now, it's no longer, uh, you know, these individual little studios who really have a vested interest in particular actors. Uh, you really are just part of this huge thing called content now. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we, way. seriously, I mean, and we, de you know, we desperately needed uh, to merge the two largest content providers hmm. to these conglomerates, wow. which was SAG and AFTRA. Wow. And we've done wow. that now. Uh, yeah. Because they don't honestly care what they're putting on TV as long as it's earning them a profit. It doesn't matter whether it's reality TV, scripted program, one hour, half hour, from cable, from network, uh, you know, movies, whatever it is, it's all about creating content. And so whether you are working as an actor, a singer, a dancer, a host, uh, a contestant, <laughs> whatever you are, whatever capacity, you're providing content for these conglomerates. That's all they care about. So we needed, we needed a conglomerate of our own to be able to go toe to toe with those other conglomerates. And that's what we've created. And, and I think that's really important to remember. You know what I find fascinating about what you just said, Woody, especially at the top when you were saying where you go from like being in a high school to a university? is um, how, f how crazy this journey is when you go back to the times of like Judy Garland and before that the golden age of Hollywood where the studios actually owned the actors, right. you know, and the whole reason the unions were created was for that and here we are fast forward, you know, however many years later and you have these giant studios and thank God this union and it feels like, you know, at least everybody has sort of a fighting chance of getting what they want. Um, just, I don't know, a little history lesson that just blitzed through my mind right there. It was really fascinating. Something else that's, else that's worth saying about merger and what was happening before merger. Because I, I, I think a lot Is of Is that what you guys call it around the office? Merger? <laughs> <laughs> with, a, with, a, with a capital M? Uh, uh, I'd, uh, the I'd happening. Say, I feel, no, I feel like I'm on the inside of something. Yeah, well, I guess merger. <laughs> the, um, you know, before... Uh, Talking about, uh, you know, it's, it, Woody, what he said really brought this to mind. You've got these media conglomerates. There are six, basically, that uh, six or seven that uh, roughly control the entertainment industry. I mean, literally about 90% of the content that is out there. I mean, you know, you look at all those little cable networks, they're owned by a couple of companies, right? Yeah. And, and uh, so it goes. And, and they... What, would, what one of the great benefits of merger is that we are strategizing now about how to deal with that, not only the technological shifts that everybody, including the employers, are having to deal with in this industry, but we are focusing our energy in one vision. We are talking in one house about how do we attack this? How do we, how do we make sure that we're gonna be okay when they start moving stuff from here to there, et cetera, and before we merged, and I can tell you this from my personal experience, even when 
the relationship between the unions was not at that, you know, sort of pre-meltdown scary place that it got to in 2008, even when it was much more cooperative, there was a tremendous distraction from the two unions basically kind of having to look at each other sideways and say, okay, you're going to, we, we got to make sure, we're, we're looking at the employers and we're figuring out what we're going to do, and we want to look at them and make sure we're all on the same page. Aren't we really on the same page? We're really on the same page, right? Mm -hmm. That chews up resources of time, energy, money, and focus primarily. Mm. We're, we've got all the best brains on staff and among our elected leadership in one place having the conversation. We do not always agree, but at the end of the day, we come out with one position, and that's going to be the position of this community of professional performers in terms of getting the best that we can uh, from our employers, and that's a big deal. It's a great point. Amen. It's a great right point. On. I love that uh, analogy of looking sideways, too. Like, yeah, you're dealing with this person at this side of the table, <laughs> and, oh, someone else is yeah. sitting at the table with me. It's really interesting. Cool. So I think we're at uh, about the time when we're going to start taking questions from audience and listeners and so on and so forth. And I have a whole stack here. So we've got, um, yeah, we've got questions. So uh, for those of you either in the audience or in the live stream that don't know, you can tweet questions. You can post them on the, the website. We've got questions coming in via email and people who are live here uh, in the room. Okay. So yeah, I guess I'll just uh, start with this one. So... <coughs> <laughs> Sean, 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 penmanship counts. Uh, <laughs> this question is for the panel. Okay, I said Paul. Panel, what about <laughs> what about an actor doing Bollywood jobs, which are mostly non-union in India as well as in the USA? Are actors supposed to do these? If something living. if living in India, or actors going from here to India? You know, from our perspective, anytime anyone takes a job that's not covered. It takes away from covered employment, and that's going to hurt them in the long run. The whole reason the union exists is to establish you know, minimum wages, good protections, good life. So you always want to make sure to have that protection with you. So it's, it's a choice you have to make. When you join the union, you're making a commitment. So actually, we, we encourage pre-members to make sure that they want to make that commitment and make sure that this is what they want to do. But you know, you just have to think in the in the big picture, and uh, you know, we d we do everything we can to try to organize more work to make sure that all actors are covered, um, all broadcasters, media artists, wherever they work, that that way they have those protections, people have a living. Is there a uh, what is the consequence for a union actor doing a non-union gig? Well, uh, Why did you take that one? <laughs> no, it's, it's okay. Uh, shame. You got, Just uh, shame. You, got, you all laughed like you got asked a question by someone else's kid. <laughs> like, that was the look on your face. You're like, man. After the tar and feathers. I'm not, I'm not your parents. Uh, wait, so I'm not going to no. yell at you, but I'm going to tell you what's what. Look, you know, we, we do uh, run into this sometimes where members uh, in a week moment, uh, decide that they're going to uh, take a job that is not a union job, and that's a, that's a violation of our rules. Clearly, we look, as Ilan just said, when you join the union, part of the benefit that we, uh, the only way we can provide the benefit is if everybody agrees that we are union members and we're going to honor the, the rules of the union, and that's how we uh, have strength. Uh, when a member works off the card, does non-union work, if that is discovered in some way, uh, and that can be discovered in a lot of ways, uh, most traditionally, or typically rather, uh, it would be from another member uh, bringing that to the attention of, uh, of the union. And there would be a, uh, a disciplinary proceeding uh, to interview the member, find out the circumstances of the job, actually confirm that that's what has happened and uh, the, uh, the, circumstance, the, the consequences of that can be a fine. It can be some other form of uh, acknowledgement of the offense and, and some sort of a, uh, I don't know, it's, it's not reparations, but some, some, some way of addressing what's been done. It's, uh, you know, not, 
it's not the first impulse of the union to kick a member out for doing non-union work. I mean, that in a weird way, that kind of rewards bad behavior. Uh, it doesn't reward bad behavior from the union perspective, but if somebody is willing to work non-union and you're saying, hey, get out of the union, well, what do you think they're <laughs> going to continue to do? We want to have, we really try when, when it's discovered that someone's working on union, we try to bring them to a group of members who will speak to them about why we are union members, why this is so important, why maintaining our solidarity is so important. Uh, so that's it. I mean, every once in a while there's a fine involved, and I guess, you know, Dylan, you know, you've, you've probably been paying attention. Yeah. yeah, and also, I mean, we have Global Rule 1, and which, which is that a union, a sag after union member can ask for a contract wherever they go in the world. And, you know, we have agreements with sister unions. We deal with ACTRA. We deal with British Equity. We deal with MEAA, which is the union in Australia. And we have agreements with all those, all those you know, various unions to cover our members in certain situations or to you know have an agreement for their members to also you know work, but absolutely we have we cover films you know botanist depart the department covers films in India. We recently signed a television series in South Africa. We absolutely cover shows all over the world. Cool. cool. I also believe in karma, and if you work off the card, you may be reincarnated as a barnacle. <laughs> a just, barnacle. Just a barnacle. <laughs> <laughs> Could be worse. <laughs> Did you? No, I just, you know, he took your barnacle thing? When you have a SAG after card, I mean, why wouldn't you want to be part of 165,000 members strong? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you? You want to be on your own, you want to be with 165,000 people. Mm -hmm. you know, there's some people out on the live stream right now going, I don't need 165,000 people. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a question from Jen. Um, she asks, what prevents bigger budget productions from abusing new media contracts? Well, uh, sorry, I, I just, could you repeat the question sure. real quickly? Because I want to what make sure prevents I bigger budget productions yeah. from abusing new media contracts? Well, I mean, I'll let Ted speak Yeah, I mean, that the, we do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have to adjust. Done. <laughs> yeah, we have signed several big budget new media productions that with not all of the television terms, with, but with majority of the television agreement terms, so, you, you know, your union does. Well, and, and it's worth pointing out that the new media uh, terms are uh, formulated as a function of budget. So if you are a big budget production, you are necessarily going to enter a different uh, uh, sphere of terms on that contract. You're going to owe residual obligations. There are going to be minimums, et cetera. Well, I don't know if there's minimums, so I don't want to say something incorrect there. But with, yeah, with, with certain um, new media agreements, there absolutely are new minimums because we've negotiated those in with the, with the production company. But, but just to, it, it would not be, if, somebody's, if somebody has a big budget, we will know yes. and they will be dealt with accordingly. Easy to work with. Hey, we, 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 make, it, we make it good and we make it, and, and we truly, I mean, I, I, I don't want to even make, a little bit light of that. It is our goal to be easy to work with and hard to fight. We mm -hmm. want to make it clear to employers that when you hire union actors on the new media contract and any other of our contracts, that we're going to bring something of real value to the game. You're going to get something that you can't get any other way, and it's going to make for a better product for you. And all we ask is that you honor the terms that we put forward. And if you do that, man, everybody's going to be happy. <laughs> I love it. Awesome. What's an, before you go on, what's an example of a higher budget new media project? Is so the, like the, the question is, the question is, what's, what's an example of a higher budget new media contract? Well, sure, yeah. I mean, you're, you're <coughs> yeah. something like you, House of Cards? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. You're starting to see there it is. big budget productions that are made under that contract. And if you go over, I think the threshold is $25,000 yes. per minute. Yes. Uh, which, I mean, I know that doesn't, uh, that sounds like a big number, but okay. think about it. 60, 
minute and none, no webisode is 60 minutes now, are they? How, how long are these things? No, some, some of the, the shows that are on Netflix are actually our shows. Okay, so yeah. if e even you know, an hour production, uh, that's what, $150,000? Uh, wait, no, that's six, so six, that's a million five. A million five to produce an episode of something like House of Cards? That that's budget. That's just Kevin Spacey. That, yes, exactly. <laughs> right. I mean, that's the point. That's the point. You chew up a budget in true big budget terms. You chew that up pretty fast. Yeah, yeah I think it was just revealed that House of Cards was a little in excess of about five million per episode. Wow. So. Wow. Man. All right. you, the one. The one thing. Uh, I'm not going to be a nerd about this. <laughs> no, I was just. I was just thinking. I mean, this is a totally selfish thought. It's not even a question. I was just thinking like. With something like that, where just everything gets released at once, I can't even be like, ooh, I'd really like to be on that show. It's done. It's done. Like, who's the casting director? It doesn't matter. Is there going to be a season two? I don't know. Um, <clears throat> How do you run for the SAG after board? That's a question we've got. <laughs> oh, man. People gun yeah, for your jobs, a, guys. There's there's like, a, there's a, there's I could do there, that. There. I could do that. They just sit on a stage and talk into a microphone. Was, was that one anonymous also? I have a voice. It is, yeah. It's a lot of good joke answers for that one. I, it is, uh, no, listen, I, it, it, one thing I want to point out for those in Los Angeles, uh, our Los Angeles board meetings are open to our membership. So every time we have a board meeting, we email the membership and let them know that it's happening. You, you email a response that you want to come. And it's a terrific way to get a look at what the board does. And I just want to encourage everybody uh, in the Los Angeles local to please take advantage of that. Uh, I certainly did it before I ran for the board. I learned a lot uh, seeing that. And I think, uh, I think any of you would as well. Um, Running for the board is simply a matter of uh, drawing a petition when the elections happen, and our next elections uh, will be our first elections. The first elections of sag after will be happening this summer. Uh, the petitions for uh, candidates will become available mid-May. I think it's May 15th or 16th. And you would simply contact the union, draw a petition, get the required number of signatures on your petition, and you're on the ballot to run. Wow. And, uh, cool. Those who are elected serve on the board. The uh, local board terms are two-year terms. Uh, in, uh, I'll just speak for Los Angeles, uh, where I'm the co-president. Uh, we, uh, we are going to have a, uh, a local board of 45 members, and our national board delegation is 28 members. So if you were to run in one of those elections, you could be one of the 45 or one of the 28. We're also going to be electing in the same election for the first time for SAG members. Uh, after I always had a convention, uh, SAG did not have a convention, but SAG after does have a convention. And our very first one is the last weekend of September uh, this year. And the delegates to that convention will be elected uh, in the same election uh, in Los Angeles. We elect a bunch. It's, over, it's slightly over 170 delegates uh, that will be electing to the convention. So you could run as a delegate as well, uh, or only as a delegate if you like. And those who get the most votes win the spots, and that's pretty much it. Uh, you know, that's how you run. I think really, honestly, the more <coughs> substantive thing to offer is what being a board member is about. And that is, uh, you know, we have a professional staff that is kind of without parallel in the entertainment industry. Our, our professional staff is just dynamite. We have some of the sharpest minds in the industry at SAG-AFTRA, but it is the elected leadership that sets policy for the union, and that's critical because we, as members, none of, let me say one thing here, board service, none of our officer positions, certainly convention delegates, none of that is paid. It is all volunteer. Every bit of union service that I've ever done, that Woody's ever done, it's all volunteer. And, and we do it in that way so that we can attract actual working members to come be part of the leadership of their union. And we provide structures so that if I get a job and I can't show up and preside over a board meeting, that's okay. There's somebody else there to take my spot. And that goes right up to the top, right up to the president. 
We, you know, Ken Howard, uh, who's one of the co-presidents of SAG-AFTRA, I think everybody's seen, he's just recently done a great successful turn on 30 Rock, many episodes of that. Uh, he works consistently. Many people in our leadership on our national and local boards throughout the union, they work consistently, and yet we, bring, we harness that knowledge of what it is to be a pro, to be out there on the sets. That's what we bring to setting the policy. And it's why I would really encourage anybody who has an interest in their union, and I urge you to take an interest in your union, it's terrifically important, that you take a shot at that. If, if it's something that interests you, come, come at least see a board meeting and, uh, and find out more because it really is ultimately rewarding and the only way that we maintain our strength. Mm -hmm. Next one is Monday night. Um, and the other, the other thing I want to say to that is that, uh, you know, there are other ways to get involved in your union besides uh, board service. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes a more effective way for you to be involved with your union, depending on what your concerns and your issues and your interests are, and, and that is committee work. Uh, there are dozens of, of committees on the local and the national level uh, and SAG-AFTRA uh, that uh, have, you know, very specific uh, uh, areas where that, you know, that they are concerned with and they are, that they are dealing with uh, and fighting for and, and the interests of. And it's a great way for you to get involved uh, with the union, for you to have your voice heard, for you to make significant changes, uh, you know, within your union. And, uh, you know, I, that, that was one of the ways that, that I started before I even served on the board, uh, was, was just becoming as active as I could. Um, I, you know, I was one of the, as I'm sure there are, you know, people in this room and, and watching uh, who tended to, you know, complain a lot <laughs> about what my union, you know, didn't do. And I... You know, it was, I got to the point where, you know, I just decided, you know, put up or shut up. I mean, if, <laughs> I mean, I, I decided that I no longer had the right to complain if I didn't try to do something about it. So that's when I started getting involved. I, I said, you know, if I felt like, and I don't, you know, whether it was true or not, if I felt like my voice wasn't being heard from the outside, then maybe it could be heard from the inside. So get involved. And if you are one of those members that, you know, that does complain or that doesn't feel like something is being fulfilled by your union and you don't do something to make a change, if you don't vote when the ballots come out, if you aren't a member of uh, a committee, if you don't try to at least run for convention delegate or for board <coughs> service or, uh, you know, attend any of the wonderful things at, you know, SAG Foundation or any of the... Uh, you know, the, the offerings that, uh, that the union itself does, then, you know, it, maybe it's time to just mm. shut up. <laughs> and I don't mean to be rude. I don't mean to be rude. But, I, you know, that, that was my reason for getting involved. Put your money where your mouth is, right? I, truly, truly. What, is there, like, a place that people can go to, to start looking at the different ways to get involved? Is there, like, a breakdown of the different committees? and? Yeah, well, on, on the uh, SAG After website, uh, there's, there's, yes, there's, okay, there's, cool. there's a list of committees. There's, uh, there's the application that you can fill out to apply for the committees, um, and that's you know an excellent way to, to way to start. Uh, awesome. You know, also you can contact any of us, <laughs> uh, you know, and a I mean ask any of us, uh, you know, how to get involved, and yeah. and what committees you know might be there to to serve you. Cool. cool. If you don't want to make that large a commitment, you know, come out and work for an event. We use volunteers all the time. And I'm going to be brave on this podcast and say if you're in Los Angeles, you want to volunteer, just email me at la at sagaftra.org. LA at SAGAFTRA? LA at SAGAFTRA.org. Wow. That was available? What? And, <laughs> and, and, and uh, listen, <laughs> the, uh, or, you know, Elian suggested working event. Just attend an event. Attend mm -hmm. many events. I mean, uh, we've got the people in this room, and I'm so grateful to see you here, but I know a lot of people are going to see this online, they're going to hear the podcast, and a lot of you are SAG-AFTRA members, and I would say to you, get involved. I mean, you know what, 
I, I, I'm going I'm to take a very slightly different approach to something Woody said, which is if you're not involved in this stuff, which is where I, and I think, clearly, we have 160,000 members. If everybody were involved, I, we wouldn't have seats big enough for all the committees. I'm, or still, I'm not, it's not that I'm throwing cold water on anybody being involved, but the majority of members, just as is true in any organization, they are not coming to uh, all of our events. They're not going to be serving on the board, certainly. And I, to you, I say, if you have a complaint about your union, I want to hear it anyway. Because as an elected leader, and I know that Woody really you know, feels this way despite his own stated reason for running, we want to make the union work for our members, whether they're involved or not. I would just say, if you're not involved, you're shortchanging yourself. As somebody who did live for a very long time, 10, 15 years, without really being involved in the union or even paying attention to it much, it was that place I wrote a check to twice a year and where I got my residuals from, right? And that's, that's the relationship that a lot of members have. I will tell you, from my firsthand experience of giving an, an awful lot of my time and energy to this over the last five years, it's tremendously rewarding. Be, not just for the friendships you'll make and, 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 and the great relationships you'll develop with your fellow members, but from feeling like you are contributing to this thing that not only helps you, helps your career, it helps all your fellows. It helps your fellow members. This is how we do it, folks. The union doesn't just magically fall out of the sky and everybody gets all the good stuff. We have to make it happen. And it's serving, it's being involved, it's being engaged, whether it's just showing up at an event like this or serving for the board, serving on the board, this is how we make it happen. If I could add one thing on behalf of the staff that works on your behalf, uh, let me bring it down to the most basic way of getting involved. If you ever have a question, either on the set or waiting for a paycheck, somebody asks you your age, what's, why should I sign in, sign out at a commercial audition, uh, where any question at all. You can certainly ask one of your fellow actors or something like that, but call the offices. And I'll say this to the camera, we have locals all over the country. Check sagafter.org, mm -hmm. pull down the menu on the locals, call an office, call the people who are paid to represent you, to act on your behalf, I get, my card must be out there after so many years. I get calls today, I got a call about a sound recordings uh, album that somebody didn't get paid to. It's not my area, but I take the number, and by the end of the day, I make sure that somebody has called them back. So that is the most, in my view, the most basic way for a member to get involved in their union. If you ever have a question, call us. That's what we're there to do. And as far as um, board, becoming a board member, um, is soliciting those votes frowned upon, say, on, like, a podcast or something like that? <laughs> I'm just curious. No, don't answer that. Um, <clears throat> I just want to say, too, I, I mean, I, I joke, obviously, a lot. But uh, one of the things that, since I have been serving, I, I mean, honestly, and people laugh when, when I say this, I, because it's probably coming from me, but I truly am honored to be on the board. I mean, it's, it's one of those things that the longer I serve, the more it sort of uh, blows my mind that, that you know, my, my fellow members have, have elected me to be a voice for them. And especially as a performer who isn't famous, who isn't a household name, you know, who isn't a regular on a series, to, to be elected to the board and to sort of uh, be the voice for my fellow performers who are, you know, those day-to-day, paycheck-to-paycheck working actors. I mean, it's a huge responsibility and a huge honor, and I absolutely, you know, take it seriously. And, and, and when I look at the history of, of both of these unions and how they were formed and why they were formed, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's really is. It's, it's an absolutely, you know, uh, un, you know, huge honor to be, to be yeah. a part of it. So, well, and I, and I acknowledge every single one of you for um, specifically edification, because, and I'm happy to be a part of it here. But uh, there was this a couple episodes back. Trev and I were having a conversation about, you know, building your reel, 
and we said something along the lines, it was not meant to be harmful in any way, we said something along the lines of, if your friend has a camera and they want to do like a short film and it's non-union, like, and you, you want to get a scene for your reel, some, it was something along those lines, like if it's the backyard, you know, production, right, the backyard production, you, you and your friends just want to put something together so you have footage for your reel, we said go for it. Somebody sort of misheard what we said and we got a phone call from one of our listeners saying like, hey guys, love the show, love you guys, just want to challenge you on something. I don't know if it's smart to be encouraging union members to do mm -hmm. non-union non -union work. And it was so awesome, like such a cool, cool yeah. conversation for us to have on the podcast because it was this conversation. Mm -hmm. So you guys are doing a, a great job of, of edifying your, your members. Do you want to add something to that? I was that that I think that response was actually based half on that and then half on another conversation that we kind of alluded to earlier about um, what are the consequences for a union member doing non-union work. Oh well, work. then good thing we asked uh, that question. So <laughs> anyway, um, um, uh, you got one? Yeah, I got a good one because I don't know what this is, um, so I'm curious. <laughs> and, is, and, it, and it's anonymous again. And those, anonymous. Okay, those are dangerous because the last one got a groan. <laughs> so is there All something right. on there you don't recognize? Because maybe we shouldn't. Station twelve. What is that? <clears throat> no, there's a. I heard a groan somewhere. What does that mean, and what is it, and how do you fix it? So it's, a, it's something you have to fix. Fix All it. right, so the term Station 12, what it is, it's work clearance. It means you pay your dues, you're cleared for work. The way how it got its name, why it's called Station 12, is because way back when, when Screen Actors Guild, I think, was in a church in Hollywood or so. We had old offices, and our archivists will probably freak out because I probably said the wrong office. But way back when, there was literally a handful of employees, and each station was numbered. And the one that was Station 12 was the person who did the work clearances. So that name stuck, and that's why it's called Station 12. And basically what that means is you pay your dues, you're a member in good standing, the producers call, they clear you for work, they want to make sure that you're cleared for work. And that's basically what Station 12 is. Okay. And, and to that, I mean, it's, we were having a little conversation before the event began, and I want to, uh, this is just a little nod to members. Uh, obviously, this wouldn't be uh, relevant to non-members, but, uh, you know, a lot of people, and I, I, I certainly was in this position before I uh, started uh, serving on the board, I would wait until I got my next job to pay my dues. And, uh, you know, I personally never got burned by that tactic, but uh, I have known other people who have, and rather significantly. Uh, you know, if you wait until the last moment to get right on your dues, and you book that job, and it's shooting tomorrow morning, and you think, hey, I'll, 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 get, I'll pay tonight, I'll get my work clearance, I'll go online. Well, they're not there at 11 p.m. Uh, mm -hmm. to, to do your work clearance. They'll be doing it the next business day, and the producers, when they call that afternoon to try to clear you, they may find out you're not cleared for work. So there can be a real downside to uh, letting that float in that way, and I would just uh, urge everybody to keep current on your dues, because when that job comes, you want to be available to do it. And that also goes for people who are interested in running for the board. So they, you need to be you know, paid, paid up. <laughs> Up I, should, I would hope that anybody who's working there has well, um, but, but, you know, I mean, you, you, but there are, are certain, but there are certain situations where <laughs> people do <laughs> forget. <laughs> only, only the members say, we don't make the staff pay dues. Well, we make them pay dues in a whole other way, let me tell you. <laughs> it's, uh, pay my dues. <laughs> pay my dues. It's nine to five. Um, I love this question because it is happening more and more and more and more. This is from Stephanie. Um, what is the union doing to protect the union members with productions filming out of state, out of country? We kind of talked about this a little bit later, but if you guys could just speak into the fact that so many productions are going outside of LA these days. I mean, you have New Orleans, this huge booming market. You've got The Walking Dead uh, shooting in Atlanta. I think The Hunger Games, you know, Southeast Coast, like Florida, North Carolina. Um, what, what, I mean, you, you have locals all over, but what do you, is it, is it becoming difficult or is the network so solid now that you're okay? Um, quick anecdote, uh, shot a feature last year and uh, was, happened to be there when a costumer opened her check and she went, oh, things you do is stay in town. 
<clears throat> and I was like, and I was in, I was in a transpo van, so I was like, like I was curious, right? I want to edify myself. I turned around, I was like, what do you mean? I said, well, I turned down the Hunger Games to be here because she wanted to be in LA. And she said, I probably would have made three times as much. So why such a drastic difference in the pay scale? And what is the union doing to you know, answer this question? What is the union doing to protect members working in other markets? Well, I mean, OK. So I or don't in this market. Yeah, let me, let me just say that. I, you know, the, the experience of this particular costumer, I can't speak to. I will say that our pay scale is not a function of where you're shooting the project. I mean, if it's, if it's under our theatrical feature agreement, you're going to be under those terms no matter where you're shooting it. Uh, same with the, our television or our, uh, you know, the after exhibit A contract. But the bigger point, the fact that, that productions are a lot more portable now and they are moving around a lot more, uh, I think is, it's primarily a function of two things. First and foremost, uh, you know, the states within the United States and other nations outside the United States, they view film production, television production, commercial production, as uh, desirable things to have in their states, in their countries, because they generate lots of jobs and generate lots of uh, uh, revenues and employment wherever they are. And so in the United States, um, you have various states offering very serious tax incentives, tax credits to producers to film their uh, productions there. And look, it's show business, 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 business. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, they sharpen the pencils, they draw the bottom line, and if it's cheaper to shoot it in Louisiana or in Michigan or in New Mexico or in North Carolina, too often, that's where they go. Now, we, what we do as a union, obviously, we are a national union, uh, as, as has been pointed out, so we're going to cover work all over this country, but. Uh, the way that we can cover certain types of work, particularly background work, uh, that's going to be stronger in certain parts of the country than others, and uh, that that is that's part of the decision that uh, might part of the, what might go into producers making a decision to uh, not shoot in a very heavily union-covered town like Los Angeles, uh, and the national union. The reason I brought that up was. We are, you know, the bulk of our members are here in Los Angeles. It's about half the members of the union reside here. And uh, we have uh, legislative programs to try to get uh, tax, and tax credit programs, film credit programs uh, here and, in, and elsewhere. We've cooperated in the film credit incentive in, incentive in New York, here in Hollywood, uh, sorry, in, in California. Uh, we want to see production happening under our contracts anywhere, but I'm going to say, you know, this business is a signature industry for the state of California, and our efforts to try to increase the value of the California film incentives are substantial, and they're going to be ongoing, because it really is sort of a, a base of gravity for the industry and for our membership. So it's very important. We're taking steps uh, the best way we know how, but we don't operate in a vacuum. It's hard to compete against a state that is just hell-bent on getting the work, and their legislature might pass a very rich tax incentive. Really difficult to compete with that. So do you, do you literally, this is for anybody, do you literally have uh, delegates who go to Sacramento? Yes. I mean, awesome. Uh, talk about yeah, that. Yes. Um, um, as my, uh, I sit on the citywide task force for filming with other unions. It's a coalition of unions because it's not only our union which is affected. It's obviously the whole entertainment industry, and we and we also sit with a lot of producers who also want to. You know, everyone wants to stay home. You know, I think producers do want to stay home. Um, the difference that we're also seeing is in places where you didn't have expert crews before, all of a sudden you're seeing crews and qualified people um, 
you know, working below the line in New Mexico and Louisiana, you know, that didn't exist a few years ago. So, but we do have local legislation. Uh, we have a committee of members that gets involved that tries to, and then we have a coalition that does meet with Sacramento. We meet with the with the uh, local leaders to try to get more incentives. And the governor Brown did sign an extension of the film credit. Um, incentives here in California last year, and I think we just need to uh, do more education, you know, in, this, in the state to try to, I think part of the issue, you know, of which, which thing is, I think it's just kind of been taken for granted, as Ned said, it's a signature staple of, of you know, it's association with Hollywood, and I think that a lot of people just kind of take it for granted that it's always going to be here, so I think it's something which, uh, you know, just has to be on all residents' mind. Yeah, and, and it is definitely something that, as these competing states have offered programs and are drawing production away, you can believe that uh, California legislators, the governor, and, and right, and certainly this industry uh, and this town are paying an awful lot of attention to that right now. Uh, and one other thing I just wanted to say quickly on this, part of what has allowed this to happen, there is this competition among states, but it's also part of this technological shift in the business. I mean, the business is literally more portable now. You, know, you, ha you used to have to, uh, the capital that you had to have to shoot a television series was intense. Mm -hmm. You had to have sound stages and big camera rigs and you were renting it all from Panavision and you had to have film processing, right? You couldn't, it wasn't digital. You weren't doing it on digital uh, editing software. That's all changed and it's made it all a lot more portable. Uh, it was harder to move production away from the centers where it was traditionally done earlier. This has been awesome. I wish we could go on for another five hours. Uh, I really do, because not only, not only am I learning a ton, but we have so many really, really great questions. Um, but the sad truth is we have just a few minutes left before we gotta wrap up. Um, so I wanted to kind of put a button on the whole thing and just ask this last question. <clears throat> what are the other benefits of being a union member? So we've got the detail, uh, and, and specifically, what are the details of like the SAG Conservatory the Film Society and the SAG Foundation. I would love to add to if um, <clears throat> if someone gets to what you were going to answer on this question. Um, what's you know if, if you in addition to what other benefits are there? I would love to hear like if there was one thing that you wish all members knew. Yes. Cool. <laughs> well, for me, this is what I wish all members knew is what they have available to them because I think that that's really important. Um, in Los Angeles, Ned said you have the opportunity to observe a board meeting. The F uh, Film Society is a wonderful screening program. Uh, we're going to be opening up uh, applications to apply for members in a couple of weeks. You can look, look on the website. And what it is that is you can join, <coughs> you pay a fee, it's at the DGA, but you get something like 50 films for like $100. It's like a dollar a person, because you, you and a guest can go see all first-run movies. Uh, we also have lots of free member programming every week at the union. We have educational workshops, seminars, um, you know, things that would cost you thousands of dollars elsewhere. They're free for you. The SAG Conservatory is a great partnership for, I think it's $35. We have a partnership with AFI, you want to talk about getting your reel, that's how you can get it done, because all AFI first-year students have to use SAG Conservatory members in their projects. So you're cast in the project, which is really interesting, because a lot of those projects, you know, they they're really test and hone your craft. Um, so it's a, it's a great way to get things for your reel, and at the conservatory we have workshops, uh, panels, discussions. Uh, we also have lots of union uh, deals and discounts that are available to members. Just by being a union member, you're part of the AFL-CIO, which has a great program called Union Plus, where they offer, you can get free legal counsel, you can get discounts on automobiles, you can get um, all, all kinds of things available to you. But not only that, but we also have certain uh, benefits that we've negotiated just for our members. Nationwide on the uh, website, if you log in as a member, it's, it's right up there. Um, in L Los Angeles, we have things to restaurants, panels, seminars, uh, all kinds of things that help you. Gosh, you know, I could just like go on and on because there are so many benefits just to be a union member that goes along with, of course, the most important thing is working under uh, wages and protections. 
You mentioned foundation. Jill, did you want to say something about that? I, um, the foundation, which does rely completely on donations, it, it is no dues help us out. Um, but the programming is aimed at SAG after members. All of our programming is free. We also have some emergency funding. But what um, the question, what I wish everyone knew, I think the SAG Foundation is very unique in that it is a philanthropic organization providing valuable programming, helping um, union actors when they're in trouble. But then we also are an organization through which union actors can become the philanthropists because of the literacy programs and going into the public schools, social service agencies, and the courts now. Um, having So it's a way to give back. It's a way to take your skill and take it out into the community. And I think it makes us absolutely unique. Um, for my part, I, the thing that I wish members knew about the union better uh, is I wish more members, more especially of our members who are, say, I don't know, 50 and under, had a clear conception of what things would be like if we didn't have the union. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard to overstate how valuable having this union is for middle class, non-celebrity working actors. I mean, it, believe me, it's it's important for celebrities as well. I don't, I don't, and I really don't mean to, you know, put that to the side. But for, but you know, the the, the, the rich and the famous and the people who are always in demand, they're always going to be okay. But for an average working actor, it is a very, very tough profession. Nobody's ever going to make any bones about that. It's a competitive business. And the only way that somebody like me, who, look, I've been in some big films and I'm grateful for that, but I've been, I've had plenty of the droughts that any working actor has. I've gone a year without a job more than once. And the only way, the only reason I have a house and I have my beautiful five children and a stable family life is because of the protections that come from being in this union. I mean, it's really the only way I've been able to make it. Uh, I, look, it doesn't matter how shrewd a negotiator I might be as an individual. I can guarantee you that when I was hired to do the Hunt for Red October, they weren't going to hire me as Seaman Beaumont and guarantee me 25 years of residuals. But I've made 25 years of residuals. And I'm going to make 25 more years of residuals because of this union. And I think a lot of people take it for granted. They say, look, and, and I did too. I, I, I got my first professional job, and it's like, hey, you're going to join a union? Awesome. That's what you do when you become a professional actor. And there's this feeling like it's just sort of this self-perpetuating thing, right? Professional actor, you're in the union. It's always there. It takes our engagement. And I think if people have a clear idea about how valuable it is, that is when we really become a force to be reckoned with, with our employers. So I hope people think about that. That's awesome. Anybody right. else, one, one, one thing you wish everyone knew? Uh, yeah, it's kind of general, but really it goes on, on the backs of what Ned said. I wish people would know that their union is, that SAG-AFTRA is not some entity outside of themselves, their families, their friends around you. We are not a third party to your lives. It is sometimes it's just a rule of nature. Sometimes it takes uh, having a check late or something happen on the set to realize the fact that you do have somebody to call. You do have a place to call. You have uh, lawyers or legal advocates. You have uh, committees. You have departments that are there to work for you. And all that comes down is just people realizing, members realizing that, you know, what they say, that you are the union, the union is you, may seem, you know, kind of words on a Hallmark card, but you realize the importance of it when something is needed. And so what I would say, don't wait until that point. <laughs> Call us with a question, join a committee, attend an event. You are the union. It is not a third party. We are here for you. So. Uh, I'll actually touch on <coughs> both parts of that question. One, I, I just want 
people, another, another great service that's available uh, to actors is the, the Casting Access Project. Uh, it's, you know, for anybody out there who, uh, who is taking, or taking, you know, the, the casting director workshops uh, and, you know, paying a great deal of money for those, uh, you know, we offer the Casting Access Project, uh, which is ex basically those casting director workshops, and they're free to the members. Uh, and they're with the casting, great casting directors and casting associates. Uh, it's a fantastic service to take advantage of. Uh, they're happening every week. It's, it's, so please, check the website, the SAG Foundation website. Uh, it's, it's a fantastic service to take advantage of. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I'll sort of piggyback on what, what Ned said. I just, I wish more people knew uh, the history of the union. Uh, if you look back at when and how and why this union was formed, uh, and on all sides, you know, AFRA, AFTRA, SAG, uh, how these unions were formed, uh, and, and, and what the world was like for performers before those unions were formed, and what they had to put on the line in order to create these unions. Uh, you know, and, and you, can look, uh, you can look on a national level with, with our own politics and policies to, uh, you know, to civil rights and, and, and the right for women to vote and things like that. Uh, you know, things, we, take, we take the union for granted the way we now take those things for granted. But if you go back and, and you really look at, uh, you know, at the roots of the union, uh, it, it, I think you will have a greater appreciation uh, for what this organization is, what it does, and what it means to you as, as a professional performer. Mine's easy. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not a member. I'm, I'm an employee of SAG-AFTRA, so my job is to work for you, the members. And um, my department, the TV department, are experts in the various TV agreements. I can tell you that because I train them all. <laughs> and so, you know, and if you, if you are a series regular and you have a complicated options question, I'm the guy to go to. But if you are a day performer and you're working on your first TV show and you just don't know how long your day is, I, we can help you with that too. I mean, anything, you know, we're, we're here to help you. If you have a claim, we'll file it on your behalf. But if you just have a question, we'll answer it for you. Okay, and thank you. <laughs> I will kind of say the same thing as Ted. Uh, working in the theatrical department, we have a group of people that are expert on, uh, on those contracts. So n never, never hesitate to call us. We dare to work for you. So please, anytime, call us, please. Every, awesome. time, every time I've spoken to the union on the phone, it has been like a full-on education. And they're so yes. patient. They take the time to answer every question so thoroughly. It is like amazing what they you guys to. do. Yeah. They want to. They yeah. want to. I had, I had uh, $14.23 in my AFTRA <coughs> account or something after the merger, and I called for a completely different reason. And the person I was on the phone with, Bless his heart, was like, did you know you have $14.23? <laughs> no, I didn't, but I'm going to enjoy that dinner. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so let's thank our panelists for being here. So obviously, obviously, you want to find out more about SAG-AFTRA. There's that website. You want to find out more about SAG Foundation. There's their website. You want to find out more about Inside Acting. Head on over to our website. Our website, InsideActingPodcast.com. And their websites will be linked on our website. I was just about to say that. So, yeah. We've been doing this for a little while. We have been, yeah. A hundred episodes. There we go. There we go. So, <laughs> so I guess we should just, thank you, thank you. I guess we should just do it uh, like we always do it for episode 100. I'm Trevor Elgar. I'm AJ Meyer. We'll see you next week. And in the meantime, don't be a barnacle. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Thank you, guys. Thank you.